class. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the class. The recording is uh, on for this lecture. So the um, lecture will be recorded and uh, we can also share it on the um, e learning portal for the benefit of those students who are learning uh, through the portal. All right, let's um, pray, then we will get started. I want to invite somebody just to please pray with us and we will get our class started. Somebody can unmute your mic and please pray. Should I pray? Go ahead, friends. Thank you, Father. I give thanks to you, Lord. Thank you as we gather in this time, Lord. As we're going to uh, in this class, Lord, help us to understand that each of the mm. uh, things that we will uh, capture and to use in our ministry, Lord. Help us understand. And so I pray for Pastor, give him wisdom that we will get more and more instruction, Lord. Thank you in this time. And also those who didn't join, I pray for them. They will join quickly, Lord. Thank you. And all things that I submit to you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Prince. Thank you. All right. So we are talking about urban church planting. Uh, and uh, we are just laying some uh, uh, basic uh, foundational uh, understanding uh, before we get into the, the nuts and the bolts and the things of, uh, you know, how do we go about doing this? Uh, yesterday, uh, we uh, started talking about getting God's heart for our cities. Um, that's what we wanted to, we uh, were emphasizing on the lecture yesterday. And we want to spend some more time on that. I will share the, the notes so that we could uh, all uh, follow along uh, in the, the notes. And uh, so we talked about, you know, the fact that God identifies himself with cities, uh, primarily the city of Jerusalem, uh, he calls it the city of the great king. Jesus called it the city of the great king, referring to the city of God. And uh, we also saw that, you know, God looks at cities. He sees what's going on. Uh, and he is touched uh, by what's happening in the cities. Uh, in the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, in the case of Nineveh, we said that, you know, God was displeased with all the sin that he saw that was happening in those cities. We also looked at, um, you know, how Jesus uh, saw the city of Jerusalem and he wept over the city. And we asked ourselves this question, you know, why did Jesus weep, uh, you know, over the city of Jerusalem, right? So let's progress on that uh, from there now. Uh, we're going to just look at a few more aspects of God's heart for the city and then uh, the emphasis here is we must, you know, capture God's heart. That means we too must have God's heart for uh, the communities we live. Now, uh, of course, uh, you know, when we... Talk about... City. Uh, you know, if each one trying to serve, that you are trying to reach. The important thing is to get God's heart for that community, for that people, uh, whether it's a city or a part of a city or a town or a village, you know, whatever community you're part of, get God's heart for them. Another important thing we want to look at in Acts, the 17th chapter, and we will read verses 26 and 27. Somebody could read that, Acts 17. Uh, 26 and 27. So we can read it, please. For us. Uh, 
Acts 17, 26 and 27. Go ahead, somebody could read that for us. And, and Peter and he had made he has made from one blood every nation of man to dwell on all the face of the earth and has to determine their the appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling so that they should seek the lord in the hope that they might look for him and find him too he is not far from each one of us okay so it's very interesting, you know, uh, right here in Acts 17, Paul is in the city of Athens. And um, Athens uh, at that time was the intellectual capital of the world. And in the city of Athens, you know, from this city and from this place uh, came many of the prominent uh, Greek philosophers in those days or just prior to Paul's time. And uh, while Paul is now speaking in that city, of course, when he comes to Athens, he surveys the city, he gets a feel of the city and so on. And it's very interesting there, while he's, he's, he has the opportunity to speak to uh, the people at Athens, uh, he says this, he says, you know, God um, has made from one blood every nation of man. That means, you know, we all have, the same makeup, composition. God created all of us, uh, same. And he says that in verse 26, God determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Very interesting. So where do people dwell? Of course, you know, at a very broad level, we say, okay, we all live in nations you know, countries, we all belong to a certain country, true. But we also dwell in communities. We also dwell in towns or villages or cities. That's also dwelling. And it's saying here that God has pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. So God's in some way, and, and, and you know, we... We don't know all the details, but God has been involved in the appointing of the times and the boundaries. The times and the boundaries. Think about that here. It says God has appointed times and boundaries for the dwellings of where people are living. Times and boundaries. So whether you think about it in terms of nations or whether you think about in terms of cities, communities, somehow God's hand is involved in that. So what I want to impress in our hearts is this, that God's hand has been involved in the community or the dwelling place where you are. Whether it's you know whether you think about it in terms of the city, or whether you think about it in terms of your town or village, or whether you think about it in terms of the nation, God has been involved in the establishing of that community, of that city, or that town or village. So no village, no town, no city, or no nation has happened by accident there, somehow God's hand is involved. Because he says here, he has determined, oh, God has determined, their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. And a very interesting verse 27, why, why, was, why is God involved in this? Verse so that people may seek the Lord and find him. So somehow in every city, there is something there, or in every community, there is something there that God has put that would point them to Jesus. You know, so we need to look for this. We need to look for this. God, 
what is there? What is there in my city that you have placed so that people may seek you and find you? Now you say, well, I never thought of it like this. Well, if you look at these verses, that's what they're indicating. So we need to begin to pray. Say, God, what about my city? Or what about the community where I'm living? What are things here that can point people to you? Because, you know, you let them dwell there so that they might seek you and find you. So what about that, God? How can people in my city come to know you? Now, you may not pray necessarily in these words, but the prayer is simple. Like, God, what is your heart for my city? How can my you know, how can these people, whether it's a village or a town or a community, wherever you're look, whatever you're looking at, how can these people come to know you? And God's put something there, which is redemptive in nature, that will point them to him. And we need to pray and ask God. Right? So when we think about this, you know, uh, we must understand the importance here of receiving God's heart for our city because it's almost like a key to unlock the city for God. Right? It's almost like if we can identify God's redemptive plan for the city, it will help us in reaching our city. So in the book, um, taking our cities for God. John Dawson, you know, he, he shares some of these things of, of being able to look for God's redemptive plan for the city. And, uh, you know, and then he gives examples saying like each city has a certain destiny and it's, it's been, it's, it's, it's known for something. And uh, sometimes one of the ways that you could recognize uh, God's redemptive plan for a city is, even if it's things that are wrong, it's been misplaced or it's been perverted, right? So instead of, instead of doing the good, they end up doing the exact opposite, the bad. But that bad is indicating that God's original plan was the opposite. So you understand, hey, this city was meant to be uh, a proclamation of the gospel, but it's a proclaiming the gospel. They may be putting out wrong things or, you know, proclaiming the opposite. But the original plan was to be a proclamation, uh, to be a proclaimer of the gospel, to be a city that would spread the news of Jesus far and wide, you know. So you can understand the redemptive plan for the city by just praying over it, understanding what's happening, and, uh, you know, getting God, God, this is the destiny. Oh, this is your plan for my city. And I want to see that fulfilled. I want to see that restored. Okay. So as we talk a little bit more about cities and God's heart for the cities, um, you know, God wants us to pray for our city. We are all familiar with Jeremiah 29. Let's go there. Uh, this is, again, an interesting uh, passage of Jeremiah 29, verses 7 and 8. Somebody could read that for us. We're all familiar with this. Jeremiah 29, 7 and 8. Somebody please read it. Go ahead. Work for the good cities of good of the cities where I have met you go as a prisoner. Pray to me on their behalf because if they prosper, prosper, you will be prosper too. Uh, too. I, the Lord, the God of Israel, warn you not to let yourself be deceived by the prophet who live among you or by any other who claim they can predict the future. Do do not do not pay any attention to their dreams. Yeah. So Jeremiah 29 verse 7. Thank you, Aaron. So he says, you know, now now the, the background is this, right? The Jewish people have been taken captives to Babylon. 
So they are actually in a bad situation, bad situation meaning they are captives. They are in exile. They're living in Babylon. It's not their home city. They're living in a foreign city. But in that city, God is saying, hey, I want you to seek the peace of the city. I want you to, you know, pray for it. Okay. You will have peace. So it tells us something very important that, you know, whichever city we are in, we can pray to the Lord for our city. God himself is telling his people, pray for the city. So we pray. God, I pray for salvation of my city. I pray for the well-being of my city. I pray for the peace of my city. I pray that this city will experience uh, Jesus in a very powerful way. Pray for the city, right? Our prayers may be very small compared to, you know, the, the challenges of the city, the needs in the city. But it's not about, you know, how big our prayers are. It's about how big our God is. So our prayers are small. But God is big, right? He's much bigger, infinitely bigger than our city. You know, sometimes when we look at our city, uh, things can be very intimidating, right? We look at our city, we look at the problems, uh, we look at the challenges, we look at the numbers of people, millions, uh, we look at all kinds of things. It can be very intimidating. But God says, you know what, pray for the city. And we realize it's not our, not, you know, how big our prayers are, but it is how big our God is, and he's bigger than the biggest challenge we have in the city, right? So we just pray, God bless our city, God touch our city, God visit our city, God let our city experience a mighty work of God, uh, that people may be saved, people come to know you. And he said, pray for the city, in its peace you will have peace. The other thing we understand, and of course you have already studied this in your course on prayer, is that uh, God looks for intercessors for the city, right? So when um, uh, when God is looking at the city, we know, we have said earlier, uh, he sees the problems in the city. He's very aware of what's happening. But he's looking for people who will pray for the city. And that's what you and I should do. And we'll just look at these verses once again quickly, uh, just to remind ourselves in Isaiah 59, uh, verses 14 through 16. Somebody could read that for us. Isaiah 59, 14 through 16, please. So shall I read? Go ahead, please. Justice is turned back and righteousness is stand afar off, for truth is barren in the street, and equity cannot enter. So truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes himself a priest. Then that, then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him, and his own righteousness is sustained him. It sustained mm. him. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, we see uh, this scripture, and we also see a very parallel scripture in Ezekiel 22. You know, in both these passages, in Isaiah 59, 14 through 16, also in the parallel passage in Ezekiel 22, 29 to 31, uh, we you know, it describes to us the condition of the city, right? That things are bad. Uh, there is no justice. People are being oppressed. All kinds of things happening. And in both these passages, Isaiah 59 and in Ezekiel 22, we see God's response. We see that in both these passages, it says, God looked for 
an intercessor. He looked for somebody who would stand in the gap for the land of our city. Right? So while God is aware of what's happening in the city, what is he looking for? He's looking for intercessors. He's looking for people who will say, God, I pray your mercy. I ask for your intervention. God, I, I, I pray for the city. I pray for you know, the things to change in my city. And so God is looking for intercessors for the city. So, the, so this is one very important reason why we need to get God's heart for the city. Because when we, we begin to see the city the way God sees it, and we're able to pray for the city, for the things that are things that matter. We're able to pray for the city and lift that up before God. Right? That we don't look at it as, okay, this is the end, this is the doom, uh, you know, this is the city will never change. It's been like this for so many years. No, we just pray and see God touch the city. All right. <clears throat> and and you know, we if we are going to work with God. We need to be able to walk with God. We need to walk with God so we can work with God. Right? So we have to be in agreement with Him in our city. Right? And so if we have a heart for our city, we can walk with Him, then we can work with Him in doing what He wants us to do for the city. Right? So I want to encourage you, you know, as we talk about. Um, uh, get, uh, you know, uh, urban church planning. As we talk about, you know, how do we work in the city, uh, in planning a church or a ministry? You know, just begin to say, God, you know, help give me your heart for the city. Help me to see the people as you see them. Help me to have compassion for them. Your compassion for them. Help me to pray for my city. As so we begin to develop your heart, that for the city. And it's an ongoing thing. It's not like I pray once and it's over. No, I mean. You can when, when we start talking about, when we get into this course, and um, let me just, yeah, when we get into this course and we, uh, you know, we start talking about some of the things we can do uh, in, in, in preparation to work in the city or plant a church in the city. And as you start thinking about your own city, sometimes it can get very overwhelming. You know, when you look at the problems, when you look at the size, when you look at the complexity, uh, of the city, it can become very overwhelming. It can be, become very discouraging. We'll, we we may tend to take the mindset that well, nothing's going to change. So first, avoid that. The city may be big, and yes, they are big, but God is still bigger. God is still more powerful. Right? So don't get overwhelmed by the complexities of the city. Second thing I want to alert us to is don't get hardened towards the city. Sometimes it's easy for us to become hard hearted towards the city. That means, you know, we get upset with the city. We get angry with the city. We say all the bad things about the city. I'm not saying don't recognize the problems. We need to. Uh, but I'm just I'm saying, don't get upset with the city. Some people are so mad at their own city, which they live in. They're angry. They're angry with their officials. They're angry with people. They're angry with certain communities. Uh, they're angry with uh, certain things that are going on. They're upset. Now, if you're upset about the city, it's going to be very difficult to do something good for the city. It's going to be very difficult to pray for the city. It's going to be very difficult to love the people in the city. So that's the second thing. Guard your heart from getting hardened towards your own city. Now, when I use the word city, remember, it could be a community among whom you dwell. It could be a village. It could be a town, wherever you're living, right? wherever God has placed you, wherever you, you know, God has put you to work. Two things. Don't get overwhelmed and don't get hardened 
towards the city. So God's heart is towards the city. And in closing, you know, uh, we see the new earth, we see the heavenly city, Jerusalem coming down. So God is a prepares a city for his people to dwell in. So you can, you know, that's just a little side note there that, hey, God does, is interested in the city and in cities and everything ends even in a city, right? So any questions uh, before we go forward? Any thoughts, any questions? Everybody's with me so far? So, what we emphasize in the little chapter is that, you know, um, we need to get God's heart for the city. Wherever you are, say, so God, give me your heart for this place, or the place where, you know, God's sending you to, or, where, or maybe he's placed you already there, then give me your heart for the city. Now, another important part here, let me share my screen. When we start talking about urban church planting is to understand the natural dynamics of urban centers, that means cities. And it really helps, it is really good for us to do our homework, to know, to understand the city, right? Now, uh, and uh, today, we have a lot of tools available. And I remember uh, plant the church, all people's church. Uh, in those days, uh, the only thing I could do was to write to a, a few pastors in the city. So uh, we were living in the US at that time. So I knew a few pastors from Bangalore and uh, I wrote to them. I said, you know, we are planning to come to the city, come and come back to back. There are areas in the city that you would recommend, where there are no churches that you would can point us to where we should be thinking of planting the church. Now, in those days, uh, we didn't have the uh, ability, I mean, uh, be, you know, to do the kind of uh, searches you can do. Today you have Google Maps. Uh, you can go online, you can survey the city through Google Maps. But those days we didn't have that uh, opportunity to do that. So, you know, we didn't have those tools that we have today. And we're talking about on, over, over 20 years ago. So, you know, we, we tried to do our homework through whatever we could. We wrote a few letters and, you know, asked people, asked pastors to make some suggestions. Uh, about areas in Bangalore, uh, but today we have tools through which we can get information about cities and places we are going to minister in, and we are going to, you know, uh, address that. But uh, let's just talk a little very briefly on how is a city different from a village. You know, if uh, just some thoughts here. Um, you know, you could just share randomly. Uh, a city, a village, what are some differences? This is to get us to think, right? Uh, you can unmute your mic or you can type in the chat. Uh, a village, a city. What are some differences that you can think of between these two kinds of places? You can type in the chat or you could just unmute your mic and share your thoughts. We're just discussing. So this is, uh, there's no, you know, right or wrong answer, perfect answer, just share your thoughts. Thomas, what do you think? Um, some of the differences are between a village and a city, especially with the context that we are uh, thinking of discussing. 
So Kiran says uh, different development. Uh, uh, um, talks about in the left side, we can. Go ahead, Thomas. Go ahead. We can you see the multi language in the city and uh, different culture, different kind of people. Villages where we, we can find one language and a simple lifestyle, the mm. simple message and uh, simple things are okay. But uh, mm. in city, they are coming from the different parts of the uh, places. Mm. When we uh, impact one person, he can go and impact the whole village. You can see in the gospel as well. So cities are the very important, especially when we are discussed about uh, Nineveh yesterday. That moved my heart. That's really mm. touched my heart. God, uh, because uh, the city is the center place where people came here and uh, being here and doing the things. So it's, it's very important to touch to the people in the city. Uh, sorry, I think my connection dropped a bit. And Thomas said, usually uh, uh, in, in a village, you know, it's very homogeneous. There is one uh, of people who are of the same culture. Uh, usually they speak the same language. But as we come into a city, it is heterogeneous. It is very complex. It's... it's um, it's diverse. You have lots of commu different communities, lots of different languages. Uh, people have come from different places, very often from different parts of the world. They're all living in a city, unlike the village. And then I see in the chat, a lot of you have typed different things. Um, there is differences in development, education, uh, colleges and schools, uh, population. Uh, in time, and it's uh, also mentioned in the kind of work, office work. These are all big differences between a, 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 between a village and a city. You know, a, a village usually development happens very slowly. You know, after twenty years, you you might see little change. You know, maybe there, there's a new building that's come up. Uh, or something like that. You know, it takes a long time before you see any change. In, in the way people are living and so on. But as in the city, things are changing very far. In this chapter, when we talk about the natural dynamics of urban centers, what I want us to understand is that we, especially for us people who are working in cities, we must be aware of what is happening in the city. Because things in the city are changing very fast. Lots of things are changing. And uh, if we are not in touch with what's happening, uh, we could miss out on impacting people. So let me just ex explain, you know, I can use Bangalore, the city, as an example. And those of you are familiar with Bangalore, you will understand, you will relate. You know, uh, in the 1980s, that time I was a student here, uh, the, the Bangalore, uh, prior to that, and you know, was was known as the guard city. It was known as a pensioner's paradise. Uh, it was known as a retirement city. Uh, Bangalore, uh, you know, the, the British were here. They had established a lot of uh, cantonment areas, very very nicely developed, lots of trees, and you know, they'd done it up well. So those those certain areas and. So in Bangalore, it was a very beautiful city. It was a very quiet city, very peaceful. 
So literally in those days, I used to cycle from home to school. Uh, it was almost like uh, eight kilometers. Uh, and so I used to you know, go on cycle on the roads. Today, you hardly find any cycles on the streets of Bangalore. You know, maybe people use it as a, you know, small in maybe in their own uh, apartment areas or so on, but you don't see cycles on the roads. But those days, the roads were, there was not much traffic, few cars, uh, the roads were literally quiet and people used to cycle from place A to place B. They used to go on cycles. It was a very peaceful city. It was a, you know, a place where people used to, you know, come to retire. They used to come to just enjoy the garden. I mean, the, the beautiful trees in a very quiet city. This was in the 80s. Then now, then what happened in the 90s, uh, of course, uh, the government uh, was doing things to develop the country. And so they invited a lot of foreign foreign companies. They opened up for foreign investors and so on. And what happened? A lot of multinational corporations, companies came straight to Bangalore. Bangalore was one of the attractive cities. Just, I mean, of course, there were other cities like Delhi and uh, Mumbai, uh, but Bangalore was you know, probably the most attractive city at that time. A lot of multinational companies came in and by the end of the 1990s, early part of 2000, there were lots of call centers and they call them IT enabled services set up here all across. And suddenly things in the city changed very drastically. You know, we went from a city that was a garden city, a pensioner's paradise, a very quiet and peaceful city. Suddenly you had all these companies come in, set up offices, and you had people moving into Bangalore from uh, just everywhere. And uh, and uh, call centers opening up every place all around the city. I mean, it is, it's good overall, good for in terms of, you know, employment and all of that. But I'm just saying, I'm just looking at the dynamics, the change that took place in the city. Uh, and then, you know, it, it had a huge impact on the youth because these call centers, they were just hiring people. You know, many of them would just finish 12th grade education. If they could speak decent English, they can get into call centers. All they're doing is answering phones, uh, you know, for various things. They get them training and so on. So suddenly the young people, they finish 12th or they finish a basic bachelor's degree. They get employed in the call centers. Uh, they would be earning huge money, which was huge for, you know, so the youth suddenly had a lot of money coming into their hands. They would work in these call centers. Another thing was people working on different shifts. You know, suddenly these young people were working at night, you know, because they had to serve the US or the UK or over, you know, different time customers in different time zones. And so that had a huge impact on the young people. You know, uh, young people had a lot of money. They were working at these shifts. They were, there were all these malls opening up in the city and so on. And so we saw a drastic change happen in the city of Bangalore. Uh, and uh, then, so this went on for, you know, quite a good part of 10, 12, 15 years. And then suddenly uh, there was, you know, the, what they call as a dot-com bust. So, so some of these things, the, the, the IT enabled services, BPOs, a lot of them began to close, you know. So people had to change, you know. And so, of course, we do have some call centers, but not as much as it used to be in the early part of the 2000s. There are still some call centers and data centers. And a lot of, there was a shift more towards other kinds of, uh, IT enabled services. So that's that's still happening, but there's been a slight change uh, more towards the development side and so on. So what I'm saying is if you look, just look at the last 30 years in the city of Bangalore, there's been tremendous change happening. The city has exploded in terms of number of people, people from all over the, con all over the country and many parts of the world have moved to Bangalore 
um, all kinds of, you know, the large multinational corporations opened up. And so it's the city in one way is booming, but then uh, there are also lots of challenges for the people. So why is all this important? Well, as a church, as a Christian ministry, we are impacted, meaning we have to be able to serve the people well. Their needs are different. The challenges are different. We have to be able to relate to all that's changing in the city. So how the church does its ministry should adapt to what's happening in the city. Right? We can't be doing ministry the way we were doing it in the 1980s. Right? Today, things have changed. Uh, people's needs have changed. Even the young people in the city, they are ch things have changed. And so what we do, how we serve, how we minister, uh, how we look at the city, you know, should change. We should see what's happening in the city and then begin to uh, minister to people uh, and meet the needs, address the needs from a biblical perspective, preach the gospel in a way that is relevant to their needs. And then we all know the last almost two years now, almost two years, the pandemic hit. So again, that has impacted every part of the world. So that has impacted our city again. So, you know, a lot of uh, people have been affected in many different ways and uh, people have lost their loved ones. Uh, family incomes have been affected. Household incomes have been affected. And a big impact of the pandemic has been on the mental and emotional well-being of people. It's a big thing. That means people have been affected mentally and emotionally because of the lockdown. And I'm not saying other things have not happened yet. They may have lost loved ones, people close to them. But mentally and emotionally, they've all been impacted. Every one of us, all of us have been affected. You know, and how do we keep our sanity? How do we keep our mind stable when, you know, we can't do the things we normally would like to do? And, 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 and so things are different now in the city. So what we should be praying about now is God. How do we reach our city now? Right? Things have changed. People are going through different kinds of challenges right now because of the pandemic, every city, every part of the world has been affected. How should we adapt to what is happening? Right? So that's what we want to talk about when we discuss the natural dynamics of the city. So let me just share this, uh, the PDF I will highlight. When we say natural dynamics, what are some of the things we should be looking at? And then we will develop this for next week. So when we talk about, you know, the natural, of course, we, we have to also talk about spiritual dynamics, which will come in the next chapter. There are natural and spiritual dynamics over a city. By natural dynamics, what do we mean? We mean, okay, a little, little bit about the history. Right? I'm not saying you need to know everything, but just a little bit. More importantly, what's happening right now, you know, what is the political environment in the city or in that region? What's the economy like? Uh, what are the demographics, meaning the age distribution uh, of people, the cultural backgrounds, uh, and so on? What are some of the socioeconomic issues? What are the challenges people are facing? And now because of the pandemic, you know, all, many of these things have been affected. What about the education? Uh, what about the distribution of education institutions? Where are the schools and colleges? Uh, what are the major industries? And where, what, where are the industrial hubs that are in the city? Uh, what about women? How are they being treated? What about unemployment? What about you know, the disabled population, prison system? Then you may look at some other things. And I've just mentioned a few, like 
you know, what, what accident rate, homelessness, orphans, uh, and other things. These are all the natural dynamics of the city that we must be aware of. And, you know, it doesn't mean, you know, you think about the, the whole, I mean, you can look at the whole city, but at least be aware of, you know, the areas where you are ministering and try to understand, you know, oh, this is what is happening um, in the kind of people that I am ministering. Because now, once you once you understand that, why is that important? Why is it important to understand the national dynamics of the city when you're planning to start church ministry? One, it's going to help us get feel for the city as a whole. Okay, this is in general what's happening in my city. Uh, these are challenges, you know. So today, when you talk about Bangalore, you know, Bangalore has a high suicide rate. Drugs is a big problem here. Uh, mental health issues are a big challenge here. You know, so these are certain things we would talk about, right? And uh, we have a high suicide rate for teenagers, for you know, young people. You know, it's among uh, highly ranked in this in, in in the country. So that these are things we need to address. Mm-hmm. So get a feel for the city, then pray for the city. So they say, okay, God, how do we reach people in this area? You know, or reach people in certain areas that are on your heart, then. As you begin to pray, God will place specific areas and needs of the city, right? So, you know, remember, uh, we are not going to solve all the problems of the city. Of, you know, that's not it. But as you begin to just pray for the city, God will place certain things he wants you to do. Right? You and I are not saviors. You and I are not going to save the whole city. But God is going to use us in specific areas and for certain needs. So that's what we want to know. God, what do you want me to do? What are the what are the specific needs you want me to address for my city? Right? So as you begin to get a feel of the city, begin to pray for the city, God will place certain things for you to do. He'll give you your assignment for your city or community. And then along with that, you'll be able to develop strategies to minister in the city or to the people in the city. So it's important for us to understand the natural dynamics because then it's going to help uh, guide what we are going to do in the city. We will get into the details of how we do this later on, but I just wanted to, you know, this is just to uh, help us say that, look, as we prepare to minister in the city, there are two areas we need to look at. We need to look at the natural dynamics. We also need to look at the spiritual dynamics. What's happening spiritually in our city as we prepare to start working? And uh, we will get into the details of how to do that. Okay. Any questions before we close in prayer today? Any thoughts, any questions? Did everybody understand when we said natural dynamics of the city, you understood what we're talking about? Yes, Pastor. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Yeah, I see it. Let's take a moment to just uh, pray together. And, uh, you know, we will pick this up. We'll expand on this uh, next week. Can somebody close in prayer and dismiss us, please? Conan, would you like to please pray and dismiss us? Can you hear me? Uh, no, Conan, sorry. Uh, this. Okay, never mind. Maybe um, can I ask somebody else to pray then? Not able to. All right. Okay, I understand. Uh, yeah, can Dave, can you pray and then we will close?
So your connection is okay. Sure, Pastor. Father, we come before you. We thank you, Lord, for today and for, for the class today, Lord Jesus. We thank you that we are getting uh, to know about the, the church planting, the ministry, Lord God, and especially the urban church planting, Lord Jesus. We, we knew today, Lord Jesus, that we have a heart for the city, Lord Jesus. And we have placed each one of us in our own different, distinct city, Lord Jesus, and help each one of us to understand your purpose and your, your will for our city, Lord Jesus, so that we can fulfill your your wills uh, for our, our city and for our country, Lord. We, we want to thank you once again for today's lesson and today's uh, whatever we've learned today, Lord Jesus. Let that be in our hearts and in our minds so that we can follow it through, Lord Jesus. In, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Karen, friends, thank you each one.